They are science-based. There are things that I do. They are far from a comprehensive list of things that could be done, but they're examples, OK? Um, from the part one presentation, the framework is that uh, research, facilitating technology, which is a developing, having a context of the possibility of long, healthy lives, and traditional and current folk medicine all together can lead to understanding, to leading to individual actions, and this plus public health initiatives can lead to possibility of life extensions. This was the framework I'm trying to promulgate from part one. Um, by the way, um, uh, I need to remind you all that this presentation should be archived, so you should be able to pull it down from the uh, Society website, from the Institute's website in the future, if you want to see these slides again, because they're going to go by kind of fast. OK? Um, do you have a favorite hack on aging? Let's just talk about this one. If aging is a program, uh, let's do a quick survey of uh, any favorite hacks. Yes. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Staying uh, insulin sensitive. That's okay. Ins insulin sensitivity. All right. That's a good one. Any others? Whole food, plant-based diet. Whole food, plant-based diet. Well, all right, you're, yeah, I'm, you're preaching to the choir, I'm, right? Um. Uh, I mentioned before uh, uh, four herbs that I use for my Parkinson's, but I'm also using herbs for a variety of other old age symptoms too. Uh, not to mention trying to reduce stress as much as possible. Okay, I'm going to hit both of those subjects in just a minute. All right, any others? Being in a state of ketosis. Being in a state of ketosis, right. Medium chain triglycerides, maybe? Okay. And he mentioned intermittent, intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting. Remove some amalgam from your teeth and detox. Okay, take the uh, mercury out of your teeth. Okay. Any others? My favorite, exercise. Exercise, okay. Any others quickly? Uh, there's one more there, yes. Maintaining a state of happiness as much as possible. Maintaining a state of happiness, right. Being happy, yes. Okay, um, well, there's a conventional wisdom that involves uh, lots of fruits and vegetables, exercise, fish, uh, good diet. Uh, these are some of the, so some of what's needed is very much conventional wisdom. You know, uh, all the TV doctors and most of the books and articles you can read, attention to diet. Um, I'm just gonna review some of these factors, Mediterranean diet, you minimize intake of sugar or simple high carbohydrates, you know, white bread, uh, better smaller meals early in the day, avoid saturated fats, burnt food. Uh, and this is advice also is useful for avoiding diabetes, insulin resistance, cardiovascular problems. There's a lot of things just that simple advice pertains to. And there's much research in pathway studies uh, and epidemiological studies that support these viewpoints. Lifestyle. Um, again, uh, regular exercise, good rhythms of sleep and rest, very important. Rich social, intellectual life uh, that we talked about before. Careful attention to diet. Attention to stress management and use of dietary supplements. And 
Uh, I'm going to talk the last three categories, which are in green. There's also some important unconventional wisdom, and I'm going to talk about some of that. Um, part of this uh, takes us back to that story of the cars, multiple incremental interventions. So uh, I'm labeling my practices here. This is practice B, is uh, uh, experiment with and adopt multiple things, just pile them on one another that seem to help. Um, uh, for example, consuming adequate amounts of trace micronutrients, including uh, the metals, selenium, lithium, potassium, and chromium. Uh, switch to using extra virgin olive oil. If you put those as an Italian origin person, I'm really horrified when we go to guest houses and they have all these little bottles of store-bought uh, salad dressings on the table instead of serving really good uh, olive oil or extra virgin olive oil. There are, there are sicanoids and other substances in really good olive oil that are extremely health producing. Um, climb stairs. Don't use the elevator. Climb up the stairs. Um, in the, uh, yesterday in the, in the airport, you know, uh, instead of going on the moving belt and just sitting there like this, go around the moving belt, move. Uh, it's these little decisions that make a big difference cumulatively. These are not breakthrough things. These are not Harvard, MIT breakthrough discussions. They're not discussed in those seminars. Um, uh, include uh, some strenuous movement in your daily exercise, maybe five or ten minutes of stress, strenuous movement. Um, uh, incorporate stretching. Uh, uh, Get up when you're sitting at your desk, and this is one that Melody's always after me on. Get up and move around a while, every once in a while. Climb some stairs every hour or two. Um, keep your intellect engaged. Uh, and, you know, for me, it, it, you would adopt an impossible challenge for your intellect, like understanding longevity. That will keep you busy enough, and that itself will contribute uh, to solving problems. You don't have to go to these uh, commercial puzzles, uh, uh, but you can just adopt issues yourself, challenging problems, and devote yourself to them. Um, uh, remember that in fruits and vegetables, the uh, most important uh, chemicals, health-producing stressors, stress dealing with chemicals, uh, accumulate on the outside of the skin. Don't scrape them off. Uh, if you have uh, uh, a tomato, uh, don't peel your tomato. Don't peel your, uh, don't peel anything you need to peel. And uh, even adopt small blueberries instead of big ones. This is what I was talking with Byrne today because they have more surface area uh, for the phyto substances in that. Eat green salad. These are. Figure out your nightly requirement for sleep and respect it. And for older people like me, uh, maximize your day-to-day -day involvement with younger people, members of the opposite sex. Keep yourself involved socially. Uh, don't let yourself get isolated. Uh, bias your eating towards healthy alternatives when you can. Eat a healthy breakfast. I have stone ground oatmeal, blueberries, walnuts, soy milk, and espresso coffee typically. And every one of those has health producing substances. Don't blow off parties. Uh, uh, enjoy good sex when it's right for you. And uh, I have a TV by my Ted Mill so I can uh, exercise while keeping my mind busy. And, being on the constant lookout for an enhancer thing. Again, it's the small decisions that make a difference. Uh, again, these are, um, uh, again, use every opportunity to see how well you're doing. Part of the problem with all these interventions is, how am I doing? You know, is this really making a difference? Well, I'm taking this, this uh, big, funny, green-looking pill now, which I wasn't taking before. Is it making a difference? I can't tell. So. Use opportunities, uh, and these include conventional me measurements, uh, uh, your lipid state, CRP, physical exams, 
Um, you should be able to bring your lipids and your triglycerides and your cholesterol scores and to really control things. Mine used to be awful. Now they're very normal. I get a lipid test and I get an inflammation test and it bores the doctors. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really boring. You want boring test results. Um, uh, again, I think electronic movement and exercise tracking is very important. I'm gonna talk about an innovation in that a little bit later that I've developed. Uh, you can select among the Apple, Samsung, Google, Android, health and fitness mobile apps. Adopt some <coughs> from yourself. They're coming out at a rapid rate. Uh, pay attention, get feedback when you can. Attention, what do your family members tell you? What do your friends tell you? Get yourself a health coach. <coughs> Excuse me. That pathology is from eating a corn chip. Um, uh, uh, here are some more examples. Uh, Again, evolve your eating, eat healthy breakfast. Again, this is a bit research, but become a researcher on your own health. You're, you're the best person to be a researcher on your own health. It isn't somebody else to tell you. You can do that for yourself and adopt the things that work for you. And constantly be on the lookout for little enhancements. Being an early adapter, I think, is an important one of uh, new health and longevity interventions. Uh, again, you want ones that are based on solid research. Uh, there's many interventions. Uh, there are many things that are hype or commercially motivated hype, and you have to be able to sort out um, what is positive. And I'm going to discuss four examples here of things that I do that are key to my own health and longevity. Pattern. Okay, I'm just, these are all examples. They're not everything you can do. And by, by the way, a characteristic of this entire presentation is that there are vast numbers of things I don't know. As a matter of fact, studying longevity science, my, relatively speaking, my ignorance is increasing faster than my knowledge. That is, for everything I learn, I learn there's two things I don't know. So the number of things I don't know grow faster than the things I know. And that's part of the game. Not knowing is part of the game. If you know, you got it wrong, okay? Um, one is stress management and hormesis. Um, uh, now, some health and longevity advice says avoid stress. Stress is bad for you. It creates real problems and live yourself a life of no stress. How many believe this is so? Okay, how many think it's not so? Okay, well, not exactly. I, I completely disagree with that viewpoint. You need and can benefit from stress, but you need to manage them. Uh, the body of science involved is a very well extensively studied body it's called hormesis, and uh, it's, um, Nietzsche once said, what does not kill me makes me stronger. Um, I'm gonna start, hormesis is about how s stress and organisms deal with it, and they are basically shaped, evolutionarily speaking, by the stresses they encounter, and what the body does, and what organisms do is when a stress comes along, they either uh, retune their networks, all those interacting networks get retuned to embody that stress, and in fact, they're a little more healthy than they were before they had the stress. Or if the stress is too much, they will kick evolutionary mechanisms into place, and we know how that takes place. My colleagues and I have researched it. It happens through something called transposable elements. And they'll start generating large numbers of transposable elements, which are all genetic experiments to see how they can better deal with the stress or evolve to deal with the stress. Um, so 
biological organisms are not designed to function under no stress. We grew up under stresses. The stresses is what helped us evolve. We are stress metabolizing organisms. We're naturally suited to live under some conditions of stress. Uh, so they function better with certain amounts of stress, not in the absence of stress. And I don't care what kind of stress you're talking about or what level you're on, the, the cell level, the organism level, uh, the species level. Um, and I don't care whether it's heat stress, cold stress, uh, uh, pathogens, um, uh, Practically any kind of stress, psychological stress, practically any kind of stress, the uh, same principles hold. Um, so there's a certain window of stress that you're better off with than not. And if there's too much stress, you get into evolution. So again, at high doses, stresses create damage. At low doses, stress promote body defenses and make you stronger and healthier. Here's an exercising person. Exercise is stress that induces a healthy response. Okay. Uh, so hormesis and stress has a dual character. It's a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of a business. And there's a well-known recurve here where um, the bottom axis is the amount of stress and where it dips below this line called RR equal one. If the stress is within that, what is called hormetic range, you have a positive body response and you're better off than if you don't have the stress. Oh, pretty incredible. Um, and we can use this in multiple ways. And I'll show you how it works in my life in a minute. If you go beyond that range, uh, up to where you're above the RR equal one flat line, then uh, stress can be damaging. And of course, stress can kill you if you have enough of it. So familiar examples of this, uh, vaccines. Vaccines stress you, your body responds to the vaccines, you develop antibiotics to a pathogen, and you're healthier than you were before. Uh, ischemic preconditioning, that is they can put a pressure cuff and restrict your circulation on your arm or on your leg um, and restrict it for 20 minutes and you have a 40% improvement probability in the outcome of you having a complication of any operation that follows that. It's incredible. Uh, they can get the same effect by cold putting coal or by heat, by administering heat. Uh, you can get the same effect by a little bit of some pathogens, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen. Um, uh, it's pretty incredible, that kind of conditioning, so that there's a whole uh, tens of thousands of articles and literature things on preconditioning uh, in medical procedures. Grit training in the Army. Uh, uh, basic training and military training uh, stresses people so they'll be better soldiers, so they'll be better able to deal with stress. Uh, exercise, again, is a stress. Um, in fact, even radiation in small quantities can lead to positive results. So it's time to stop thinking about stressors like reactive oxygen, species, heat, cold, hormones, as good and bad, but instead start to thinking about what is the range of stress I'm experimenting with, and what is the range where the stress is going to hurt me, and what is the range where the stress is going to help me. And um, it has to do with a lot of uh, longevity, and, and I'm going to talk about some species where we see how species that live under incredible stresses have an incredibly long lifespan, some of them. Um, you know, we know that fruit flies, uh, re uh, repeated application of heat stress, they live longer. Um, multiple stressors in uh, nematodes will extend their lives. And in multiple species, calorie restriction, which is another stress, as we all know, 
So these work through multiple pathways and multiple levels um, uh, to extend lifespan. Um, some long-lived species are exposed to repeated hormetic shocks, terrible stresses. These, these are pines that live uh, not too far from here uh, in the White Mountains, the bristlecone pines. How many know about bristlecone pines? Oh, wow, okay. Um, they are the longest species. They live up to 5,000 years. Well, somebody argued, well, you know, they sort of proliferate by the roots and it's a descendant that lives. It only lives 2,500 years, not 5,000 years. Um, uh, they uh, live between 5,600 and 11,000 feet. The winds are incredibly strong. Uh, you have long periods of drought, uh, high winds, dry soils, uh, and hypoxia, lack of oxygen. There's a lot of horrible things. Water moisture can be uh, absent, but they're extremely disease resistant. The needles can last that long. Uh, how many know about the naked mole rat? This is a classical example of longevity pathways. There's many articles about these little things. They're about the size of a mouse, um, but they can live up to 30 years, where a typical mouse will live a year and a half or a year. Um, uh, they live in uh, tunnels underground where there's not enough oxygen, where they live in their own excrement, uh, where uh, in their own pee. Uh, they're very vicious little creatures that go to war with other colonies. They have high, very high stresses. Um, but they show very little decline due to aging. They're sexually active right up towards the end. Their bone health is good. Their cognitive capability is good throughout their lifetime. They don't get cancers. No cancers for these guys. Hmm. And um, they have a basic good hypoxic response. Uh, they have multiple mutations in the specificity of uh, heat shock protein HIF1-alpha. And uh, uh, they have six times the amount of endogenous, that is natural expression, of a certain uh, gene and uh, gene activating substance, a transcription factor called nuclear aerosoid factor two, which is abbreviated, and everybody calls it NRF2. NRF2 is a very, very important factor, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and they have uh, very high natural levels of these substances, too. Bats are another long-range species. Uh, uh, the lifespan are 20 to 40 years. Rats of the same size live two to three years. Um, uh, they live in dank, dark, dung-filled caves. Uh, uh, nobody, you know, they don't live in the Hilton. Um, they really get sick or debilitating infections. And they're the only one of, they can fly a thousand kilometers, 700 miles in a, in a single night. And such exertion involves great free radical stress, but they have powerful free radical defenses and DNA repair systems. Um, so these and other long lived species raises the question, what role do repeated hormetic or non-hormetic stresses play in the longevity of very long species, long-lived species? And some of the more optimistic, pessimistic among us, a gentleman in the front row here, said, you know, are we suffering from lack of stress leading us into complications now, uh, the sedentary lifestyle uh, where everything is taken care of? Um, so the question is, can we use stresses? Uh, and I believe we can in the interest of health. And the question is how to keep them in this hormetic healthy range and how to manage them. And some are heat and cold exercise, endurance demanding activity. I'm going to give you, there's a lot of these. I'm going to just go through a whole bunch. I'm going to go through a typical day of mine, which I documented back in 
2014. This is what uh, New England looks like, where we live um, near the Boston area. This is off the back deck from my office, which is in the upstairs floor of my house. Uh, there's a lot of snow. Um, so uh, in a typical day, I'll make 10 trips outdoors, going up and down these stairs to go to my office. That's the exercise of going up and down the stairs is the stress. And the cold, cold shock. What are the pathways involved? Cold shock proteins and the PGC1 alpha protein, which is uh, the exercise protein. Um, I wake up in the morning and I'm usually cold. It's cold in our bedroom in the morning. Uh, so uh, I stay cold for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour. I go in the bathroom, it's next to the bedroom, it's cold. Uh, it's a cold shock pathway. Have some blueberries, walnuts, and substance. Well, actually, these substances are natural substances which activate that NRF2 pathway I talked about, which, which is a natural stress pathway. So many, many natural substances or phyto plant-based substances activate NRF2. Now I'm gonna talk about NRF2 and inflammation and stress in a little bit. Um, I, get, I, I got that morning into an, uh, a phone call with a, an Indian person and, um, in Bangalore who didn't understand my computer problem and there was a certain amount of stress there, uh, cortisol pathway. Um, I had a minor fight with my colleague, Melody, who is also my wife, and uh, uh, this involved a certain amount of stress. And she helps, uh, when I get unstressed, she helps crank it up a little bit. Um, uh, I, pardon? It's mutual, right. We stress each other. Um, I um, had to shovel the snow to get up these stairways, so that was a PGC-1 pathway. Um, and uh, this was a, just a picture of me in a gym at one point. I wasn't really lifting that. I was just... I, um, uh, the tree came down. Uh, in our backyard, and I had to chain it off, cup, chop, cup it up with a chainsaw. So there were a certain amount of gas fumes and gasoline spilt on my um, hands, which also activated the NRF2 stress pathway. I did an, an, a nasty thing, a pepperoni snack that day, which uh, uh, was a big stress. More plant-based supplements during the day, mixed nuts, are very nuts are very very good for you, and they activate the NRF2 pathway. And supper had some of these ingredients in it, and uh, my favorite piece of chocolate during the date. And uh, again, uh, cold shock at night when I went to bed. So none of these are breakthrough. Interventions, none of them are. Every, every, stresses like these are available to everybody. And the key thing is to know those stresses which you can handle and those which are non hormatic. And I'm going to tell you about an invention, uh, one of the things that I've created about uh, knowing the difference to help, to help tell the difference, you know, how you feel about it. Uh, I found this diagram about stress on the internet, which um, uh, it has, says a lot about the different things you can deal with stress. And so learning how to navigate through all these things and actions and mindsets is very important. Uh, diet and dietary supplements is very focused. Here I want to focus on activating this NRF2 pathway. That's the NRF2 molecule, and it's... Uh, it's a natural molecule that occurs in the body. It's used in many of our systems, and it's activated by stress. When I get cold or when I shovel snow, um, uh, upgrading PGC1 alpha, which is uh, the basic thing exercise, uh, promoted by exercise, and I'm activating NRF2. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this because uh, it's a good example of what it is. It's a gene transcription factor 
It has to do with what genes are turned on and turned off. Um, it's a master regulator uh, of stress response and oxidative damage. When NRF2 is turned on, uh, and it's turned on by turning off another factor called KEEP1. It's funny, you know, KEEP1 keeps NRF2 in the cytoplasm, which is not the nucleus. But if you turn off KEEP1, then NRF2, as they say, migrates into the nucleus of the cell, where it turns on some 240 health-producing genes. Actually, uh, I think the latest number I saw was more like 260 genes. These genes uh, control inflammation. They control uh, stress responses. They control your energy level. They control multiple things that are beneficial to you. So this is really good stuff, this NRF2. Um, uh, they, uh, is, well, here are the, some of the things they do. They detoxify poison. They inhibit cancer responses. And NRF2 can be turned on by many stresses and by plant-based foods that contain phytochemicals, like I gave some examples in my thing. And many dietary substances contain those phytosubstances. Here's some natural places you can get them. You can get them from red hot peppers. You can get them from kale and spinach. The lower left-hand corner is a, uh, a substance called bitter melon, which is very good for you. How many know about bitter melon? Wow! Wow, I've never seen that kind of response. Um, yeah. Bitter melon, yes, very much. Bitter, bitter melon is a very interesting thing because it has about 17 different names and occurs uh, in Brazilian culture, in Brazilian, two or three different Brazilian cultures. It exists in Jamaican culture. It exists in Chinese medicine. It exists in Ayurvedic medicine. And it's been discovered in multiple parts of the world. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's an example of folk medicine, which in my mind is a tremendous resource because uh, there are so many things in folk medicine we can adopt that have been studied. The one in the lower right-hand corner is ginger, by the way. It's not, those aren't worms, those are ginger pieces. Here are some of the uh, dietary chemicals, flavonoids that activate NRF2 where they occur. Um, uh, I'll just read the first couple. Uh, anthocyanins exist in red, blue, and purple berries, red grapes, red wine. F uh, flavanols exist in teas, chocolate, grapes, berries, apples. Um, uh, Theophins exist in chocolate, apples, berries, red grapes, red wine. Flavones exist in citrus fruit, etc. Uh, uh, yellow onions, scallions, all these things are good for you. Uh, soybeans. Uh, uh, and uh, so these are all great things. Everything here that you see in a slide activate NRF2. You wonder why these are good for you. Well, that's one reason. Uh, and they activate not only NRF2, but many other epigenetic and gene-activated pathways, DNA repair genes. Uh, they inhibit inflammation. They uh, change the shape of your DNA, the, the way your histones respond, uh, uh, the way your DNA is wrapped around spindles in a way to protect you. They do numerous things. And one of the things that was recently discovered is that uh, studies of our RNA in our bloodstream, guess what, folks? I know more than 20% of that RNA is not ours. It's plant-based in our bloodstreams. We carry plant-based RNA. Well, we do. Now I'm going to talk more about that. So uh, they create stress signaling and hormetic response in cells. Um, uh, I gave you some examples of how NRF2 is involved in aging and a number of species. Uh, and it, it, 
believe me, there are, I'm not talking, when I talk about research documented things, I'm not talking about three research papers about one dietary substance. I'm talking like about 750,000 such research papers. I'm talking about a vast bodies of research. Um, Just a comment, longevity is the art of not dying. Um, uh, there are many other pathways that relate to longevity. FOXO, FOXO3A, IGF-1, and mTOR are pathways you want to respond. I talked to PGC-1 alpha, NAD, uh, uh, mitochondrial pathways. There's a long list of these things, and there's much, much detail about these. Any one of those names or substance could be a two-hour presentation just to cover the basics. So, very complicated. So, key points here are uh, NRF2 is closely con associated with the control of aging in a number of species. It's high in the long of its species. Uh, Increasing its expression can help prevent, ameliorate, or clear up numerous age-related health problems. Documented over and over and over in the literature, again, not something I'm invented. Why doesn't Big Pharma sell NRF2? Because it's everywhere, there's no money in it. Okay. Um, uh, and again, there are other health pathways so the bottom line is learn more about this. I want to talk about control of inflammation because one of the key things NRF2 does is control inflammation. And I'm talking about a kind of inflammation. This, the inflammatory response is a natural response. We need it. I wouldn't be alive if I didn't have it. It's, it's what happens when uh, an insect bites you or you encounter a pathogen in your skin. You get inflammation. Inflammation. Uh, is a response that causes all kinds of cells to migrate, it turns red. Normally, this will respond. But there's another kind of inflammation called constitutional or chronic inflammation that happens with certain disease processes and unfortunately with aging. And this kind of inflammation is sort of central to all, not just some, all of the chronic age-related diseases that mostly kill old people, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, pulmonary disease, arthritis, autoimmune diseases, neurological diseases, uh, diseases uh, that, uh, arthritis, oh yeah, that's on there. Uh, and here's another one, in fact, there's a, a word that's coined that's often used in the literature called inflammaging, where, um, uh, these, it's hard to read these diagrams, but these show you how inf the pathways through which inflammation will create anemia or uh, create anorexia or autoimmune diseases. Certainly the autoimmune diseases are key to the point. So inflammation, chronic inflammation, is a very, very central thing. And there's many channels of this, many, many things that cause chronic inflammation, uh, and here are some of the ones. Uh, Pro-inflammatory cytokines, how many have heard about them? Okay, they're the, they're the ones uh, that are released, but there are many other things that will create it, like uh, if, you, if your gut microbiota, if, the bi if your gut biome doesn't have the right bacteria in it, uh, you can create that. Or if you don't respect sleep and circadian rhythms, you can get it. Many, many things. Here was a Time article a few years back on inflammation, uh, the secret killer. Uh, it was a special issue on that. And uh, my response is that the anti-inflammatory herbal substances are the killers of the secret killer called inflammation, that we can kill off or we can inhibit that chronic inflammatory response. Um, it's entirely possible to do, and I'll talk. Again, constitutive inflammation or chronic inflammation is at the heart of all those diseases. 
Controlling it gives you a better quality of life. It enhances your constitutional defense levels, slows down disease processes. And a basic message is that plant polyphenols, this NRF2 I was talking about, can significantly reduce inflammation. There's a hooker in there, which is, I mentioned earlier, that the bioavailability, the ability of those many of those plant-based substances to get where they need to in your body when they need to is very limited, but we can do something about that. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some personal research in a minute about how we can increase bioavailability. Here's another thing on inflammation on the cell level. Uh, there is a key uh, transcription factor uh, called nuclear factor kappa B. You see it here, it's called NFKB which is the central regulator of inflammation. A chronic inflammation is generated by the activation of NFKB. Um, and uh, again, there's multiple, what they call it, comorbidities. Uh, it's key in HIV, among other things. And it's both a cause by and a consequence of most disease processes. So you say, does inflammation cause disease? Yes. Does, do diseases cause them? chronic inflammation? Yes. And in most cases, it's cause and consequence. Um, now, I'm going to talk about uh, plant-based anti-inflammatory substances. Uh, there's many, many of them. There's hundreds of them. And uh, different practitioners have different favorites. I think Byrne has some favorites and some ones that he uh, would recommend under circumstances. Um, uh, they have been extensively researched, as I said, and they have very strong properties and some of the lesser known ones have names like Google, Neem, Ashwagandha, Punavara, and Gamboge. How many of you know about any of those? Okay, you guys are relatively sophisticated. Again, uh, on this plant-based polyphenols, I said there's about a, a, some near 50,000 research papers. It's very extensive. Um, one thing is that I talked about NRF2 activation, and on the other side of this diagram is nuclear factor, which is inflammation. And uh, these bars, when you see a flat bar like that, it means inhibit. So that uh, NRF2 and NF kappa B, the pro inflammatory and the factors that's created by the stresses, NRF2, mutually inhibit each other. So you can inhibit inflammation by that. Uh, again, this is about what they are, their transcription factors. Uh, I'm repeating a little bit here. Um, and uh, the bottom line is that many plant-based substances can turn on NRF2, and here's I think you saw this diagram before. Here's some of the mechanisms of operation of those substances in this diagram. Repeating these, that slide you saw before. And some of these slides, I think I have a slightly repeated here. Um, yeah, here's another. Just take just one substance, curcumin. Uh, this is in substance in turmeric. These are all the pathways around the edge through which inflammation can occur. NF kappa B is there, uh, EFGR, uh, HER2. There are different pathways that apply in different places in the uh, uh, in, in biology, and curcumin can inhibit each of those pathways shown on this diagram. It's quite amazing what one substance can do. Um, again, many different, um, so there also some pharma interventions are being studied that 
could possibly add to some human lifespan. So I think pharma is busy doing this, and they're working on the Clotho pathway, the mTOR pathway, FOXO3 pathway. Uh, there's a lot of buzz recently about the NAD pathways. Um, uh, much of what is in the research literature that extends life of mice is by genetic modification, and genetic modification is a no-no for human beings, so uh, many of the interventions can do. Personally, I, I seriously personally doubt whether pharma's going to give us the answer to this for the 10 to 20 years. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's going to come from pharma. So Vince, yeah. I want to make you aware of the time. We've got to be out of here by 10 o'clock. Okay. I'll so in, if I wrap up in five minutes, is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I'd kind of like to leave a little bit of room for questions, All too. Right. So. so they won't get us beyond 122 years. I just want to show you some research labs. Uh, these are some modern research labs. They've been at finding health-producing proteins for 40 years. These plants, every single one of these plants is a research lab, a research lab producing substances in the interest of their own survival. They've been at it for maybe three million years. And the field's called xenohermesis that shows its stress. One project, I'm, supervi I'm supervising a couple projects. One of them is enhanced delivery of phytosubstances, getting them past all the various barriers shown here to make it bioavailability. And uh, uh, the problems of bioavailability uh, crunch. And we use something called liposomal delivery. We're developing a blend, uh, Melody and I and, and some colleagues are developing a uh, supplement that has high bioavailability. Uh, we've been taking it personally for, um, for um, two years now, more than two years. It's a, you know, my rheumatologist did not believe that my, I could get rid of my uh, arthritis. It's completely gone. Uh, and other inflammatory conditions. I, I could go more into this, but I'm, I'm in rush mode now, okay? Why enhanced viability? Targeted delivery, they're natural, they're used in the body, and they're made of lecithin, which is the main ingredient in our cell walls. Um, uh, they can be made from sunflower seeds, uh, uh, the lecithin, and uh, we have four powerful anti-inflammatory herbs that are known to, be, um, uh, to work by different mechanisms. This just says that we're uh, go, we're now in going into commercial development, and we're looking at, uh, here are a few of the other thousands of um, substances that, um, herbs that are anti-inflammatory. The other thing I want to talk about quickly is how do we know when we get a stress, when we adapt a new stress, how do we know it's hormetic? Well, um, one thing that we've done, that I've done, is develop some stress measurements based on personal stress me measurements that are daily stresses uh, that are based on measurements made overnight while I'm sleeping by my smartwatch. The smartwatch communicates to my cell phone, which talks to a database in the cloud. And uh, it tells me um, what my resting heart rate is just after I go to sleep and just before I wake up. These are well-established measurements of stress. The lower your resting heart rate is, the less stress you have. By comparing my heart rate just after I go to sleep with that in the morning, I can tell how much, my, how much stress I'm starting the day with, what my level of stress is, and I can tell how much stress recovery there was overnight. I have... Um, these are well-established things. Um, uh, I have been measuring these for a year. I have personal data for a year. I've correlated personal data. I filled in a spreadsheet every morning um, with data from the smartwatch. And I'm able to correlate the 
difference between the stress levels. See this point where the blue line and the red line, that shows very little overnight stress recovery. This, uh, over to the left of it a little bit, um, shows a great deal of stress recovery. So this has been another area which I've done some research. Um, and I'd be glad to discuss this. And I promise to wrap up in a minute and a half. I've lost, licensed this technique to a company called Stevia First, but I'm still the lead researcher in the process. Bottom line of both of these presentations is that on a personal level, it's possible to improve your personal lifespan and health condition. And you may be able to beat the uh, averages to beat the uh, expected lifespan by 10 to 20 years. Uh, don't expect this to happen via medical intervention, breakthrough, or pill. Um, it requires a commitment to constant learning about yourself and doing it, apply, learning knowledge about yourself and your own circumstance. It's a messy process. And things don't always work out as possible, but if you make a research project out of it, you probably have a good shot at succeeding. And uh, at least so far, it works for me. And uh, remember Woody Allen said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it by staying alive. And uh, that, I think, is the basic message. Here's our research team. There's uh, Dr. Jim Watson, who's one of the most, who is perhaps the most brilliant intellect I've ever met in my lifespan. I've met a lot of them, is, is, could not make it here. Uh, his sister died and uh, Melody's member. So that's it, thank you. All right. It's really tight here. Maybe one question, maybe two if they're short answers. So how do we avert Alzheimer's? How do you avert Alzheimer's? <laughs> Pardon? Uh, uh, th th there is a wonderful paper by Neil Bredenson, I think is his name, um, which states uh, six or eight common, ordinary, simple interventions that you can do, uh, most of which I've covered in this presentation, that decreased it by, I think, the probability by 80%. Um, I think, I don't think I'm gonna get Alzheimer's. I'm not gonna get cancer. I'm not gonna get any of that stuff because I'm, I'm preventing inflammation. I don't know what I'll die from. Who was that author again? Neil Bredesen, B-R-E-D-E-S-E-N. Hi, um, I have a like a paradoxical response to certain things like ash ashwagandha uh, or turmeric or things like that. I start sweating and I, my sleep is affected and all that. I, so there's many things that I can't take because I have these, it really hurts my whole, you know, so I just avoid them. So why, why am I doing that? Why is my body doing that? Uh, I, it may be that you have an immune response to some of those. I mean, um, a ton. I could go we, down, we, go we to are, cola, are, blah, 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 blah. You, you know, huge list. Conventional science says never pay attention to N equals one, one person. You have to have number of people. Every one of us is N equals one. Every so, one of us is different. So am I, is it my body can't handle that or these are things I should avoid and they help me or, I mean, I have so many things. Could be dosage levels as well, maybe cut the dosage way down and build up. Uh, the, pro the problem, one of the reasons for the liposomal delivery is uh, to have bioactivity in yeah. very, very large doses. And that can make okay, so Vince's battery just died. Uh, let's give Vince a round of applause. <laughs> so thanks, Vince. Uh, our next meeting, we're here every third Thursday of the month. Our next meeting is with Dr. Adele, Adele Teloran on GI health. So like uh, Bernd and Vince mentioned, everything starts in the health. So